being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So I should have warned you, Sherry says I don't have a musical bone in my body. And if I try to keep count, you'll just see me going like this instead of singing. So, Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you are a mighty, awesome God, worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. That you would choose to create us, that you would choose to continue to love us in our sin and our shame, that you would redeem us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and that you would come to live with us through the power of your Spirit. All praise, glory, and honor to be, be given to you, Father. Lord, fill us with your Spirit today. Teach us the way of Jesus. Teach us to love you, Lord, with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength, and to love others, to have the compassion and the mindset that Jesus had, that he considered it joy to go to the cross to save us. We thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this, Race You to the Finish Line. I know we don't think about that as much as we get older, really. But as I have grandkids, I do think about it because I hear all the time, Kira says, I race you from the house up to the swing set. That's a long way. <laughs> and it's uphill half the way. I remember when you were at the pizza stand and wanted to race. You said that. You always. remember that? <laughs> Did it? Yeah, so I'm, I, you race you to the finish line. It doesn't mean that I'm out here to beat you or anything. It's the fun of racing together, you know, because... I always trip or stumble or get tired first so that, that she can win and she just loves it. And, and every once in a while I watch her follow my pattern and say, look, look, Papa, I stumbled so you could win. <laughs> we're in this race together. And we're in this race together with one another, but we're in this race with God. We're fellow workers with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Run this race well. At the beginning of Hebrews chapter 13, in the NIV, if you have an NIV version, there's a subtitle in most of them. Um, and that's there, it's not in the original text, it's there to help you understand what you're reading. It's called, called Concluding Exhortations. An exhortation is an address or communication emphatically urging someone to do something. So we're in chapter 13. Uh, the author of Hebrews is, is wrapping all of this up so that the Christians don't fall short, that they don't leave the gospel, that they don't drift at sea or run aground or anything else. And he's trying to get them convinced that they need to run this race, the way of Jesus, this life of the church, the way a Christian should live, and run it well and run it to the end, that you'll finish well. If you look at the biblical definition, you'll get a little more understanding. Um, exhort comes from the Greek word paraklesis. That should sound a little bit familiar. Paraclete is the word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit, for a comforter, which Debbie used in the verses at the beginning. We didn't plan that. That, that because of God's amazing grace, His love, His compassion, His mercy, that you are comforted because you faced a, an eternity apart from Him. You were to face the wrath of God, but because of His love, His grace, His mercy, through the blood of Jesus Christ, if you simply believe by faith, you are saved by grace. Grace to do, the, to do and live the kind of life that Jesus calls you to live. <clears throat> the Word is an emphatic urge to action, but it also means that someone is called alongside of you, the Comforter, to help you do it. I mean, God created us, He redeemed us, and He lives through us if you'll let Him live through you. The Holy Spirit will transform you, guide you into all truth so that you are like Christ. If heaven is a place where there is no sin, which it is, and there's no if there and everything, there's all peace and joy, no tears, everything else, then Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
God bringing salvation to earth, bringing His kingdom here, and it's in the way that we live as Christ in this world. Don't forget that. Because you used to live some other way. However bad it was, however good it was, whatever it was, you didn't live with the mindset of Jesus Christ who gave up everything to save you. That is the mindset that we're supposed to have as the body of Christ working together with Him to, to bring God's plan of reconciliation to man. Because Jesus, as the author of Hebrews said from the beginning to the end of this, is greater than anything else anyone can fathom. So is He the greatest to you? Is He the greatest in your life? Will you live for King Jesus and serve Him? Or will you continue to shy away from His leadership, from His kingship, from His lordship, because you continue to do what you want to do instead? Run your race well, because Jesus has come along beside you to run with you, to, so that you can be like little Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 5, the scripture we read this morning. Therefore then, therefore, because of this great salvation that you have, if you have any encouragement, there's that word, paraclesis, from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from His love, if you have any common sharing in the Spirit, if you have any tenderness and compassion, if you have any of these things, all you need is mustard-sized faith, right? And, and Jesus will grow it. Do you have, uh, are you united with Christ? Do you have comfort from His love? Do you have a common sharing of the Spirit? Do you have tenderness and compassion? This kind of builds up. Because, you know, getting to that tenderness is one thing, but compassion is something else. Compassion is the love to do something regardless of what the person did to put themselves in that situation or did to you or anything else. That's why love is patient and kind and keeps no records of wrong or anything. As love is a choice to love even the unlovable, to love even your enemies. So when they ask you for your, for your jacket, you give them your shirt also. When they slap you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek to them. To love like Jesus loves, like He taught. If you have any of those things, then make my joy complete, what Paul says, by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. You know, one thing that God has taught me, not through being a pastor so much, but being in the ministerial association, is to not point fingers at those that are in need, but to love them as Jesus loves them. So what if they put them in the situation that they're in? You put yourself in the situation you were in when you sinned against God and you deserve His wrath. Do you not comprehend grace? And God gives you grace upon grace upon grace so that you can be gracious to others, even your enemies. Do nothing out of self-ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. No stipulations there, anything else. There will always be needy among you, Jesus said, and that's why I'm leaving you here, to be my hands and feet, to show them love and compassion, not to point fingers, to show them tenderness, to show them the love of God. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now that's something to go contemplate, isn't it? The mindset of Jesus Christ, that at being God did not consider equality with God something to be used for His advantage. But instead, He prayed, Father, Your will be done. So how are the ways that we're supposed to show love? This is a review again, if you don't get it. This is from the first part of Hebrews chapter 13. Love, love more and more and more and more and more. Show hospitality more and more and more, even to strangers. Don't get out of the habit of doing so. Remember those who are mistreated and suffering. It doesn't matter why they're mistreated and they're suffering. The kingdom of heaven is to relieve injustice, to relieve poverty, to relieve all these things, drug addictions, everything else, all this sin in their lives. They need someone to show them Jesus by the way that you love and the way that you live, not by just the way you profess. 
Be pure and loyal in your relationships, not lovers of money. Instead, be content. Be mindful of your leaders. Imitate them. Don't be deceived by false teachings. You have an altar to lay your sacrifices on your life. What else do you have to give? Follow Jesus all the way, whatever the cost. With these kind of sacrifices, God is pleased. That's Hebrews 13, verse 16. If you keep reading from that point on, with these sacrifices God is pleased, we'll read in verse 17 to the end, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you. That's my job, and I take it with pride. I take it with joy. I take it with humility that I can lead you as Jesus leads me. So I have to let him lead me so that I can lead you. I have to be an example so that you will imitate me. And I fall short. And forgive me when I do and help me along the way because we're in this race together. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a, be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no, of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are, sure that we, we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you. Then if you're reading in the NIV, there is another uh, subheader here to help you. It says, benediction and final greetings. A benediction is a declared blessing from God to His people, to whoever the people group is. This is the church, the Hebrew church, that is suffering, who is being plagued with false doctrines, who are getting weary and tired, and some are falling down along the way and, and losing sight of the goal. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. Not so that you can be saved and just know it, but so that you can be saved and that your life will surely show it. That we are a people called to action. That this is not the church, this is the church. And the church is the body of Christ, the hands and feet. Doing good, which go back to, to verse 16, these kind of sacrifices are what God is pleased with. Bringing justice, love, mercy, grace, healing, comfort, and of course the gospel message. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him. There we get pleasing again. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Amen means you agree. Amen. Amen. That we are called to be the body of Christ. That means we have to have the mindset. We have to be driven by the Spirit. We have to love unconditionally. And we have to show that love to this world. Because there is a world hurting and in need. And if you don't know, even in this country which is so blessed... Diesel is over $6 a gallon at some places right now. That affects every bit of your commodities, your travel, everything else. And there are people in this town that live off a of fixed income. What are they going to do? Has it crossed your mind? How are they going to live? Because if they had X amount to live off of, that's the same amount they have now. Their utility's gone up, their food has gone up, their gas has gone up to get around. Oh, guess what? Insurance will go up too. Everything else will go up. Uh, their landlords have raised their rent up because they can. Because if, if you can't pay it, someone else can. I don't think that's looking out for the need for others. No, I'm not going to get on a soapbox. But if you thought about them, if you have compassion for them, and then does that compassion drive you to do something? To at least go check on your neighbors in your proximity and see how they're doing. Even maybe taking them a meal might mean the greatest thing in the world to them. Have compassion, thinking of others over your own needs, especially if God is blessing you. Because the one reason He might be blessing you is so that you can bless others. The one reason He might be comforting you is so that you can be a comfort to others. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. There's the word. For in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. You can read this in about 45, 50 minutes, the book of Hebrews. 
I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. Grace. This unmerited favor from God, this, this that you don't deserve, this blessing, this privilege, this thank you, this hallelujah to the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, He who would die for you so that you might live for Him. Praise be the name of Jesus. Something you don't deserve, grace, and something that you're given so that you can be gracious with it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8-10, through 10, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Do you get that verse? Because when you show love to someone who doesn't love you back, they don't understand why. When you show an act of kindness to someone who doesn't get, act kind to you, they don't understand why. When you love just because the one that loves you loves you first, so you know what love is and you love your brother, the world sees it. And they especially see it by your actions more than your words. Love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality, there's that word, to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift, that means grace is a gift, and all kind of other gifts that the Spirit will give you. Use whatever gift that you have received to serve others. How? As faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Don't take grace lightly. The reason you have the freedoms that you have, the privileges that you have, the things that you have, is because God gave His grace upon you. Tomorrow morning you may wake up with an aneurysm. You may not wake up at all. You may wake up with all of this distress in your world or your freedoms taken away. Praise God with the grace that you have each and every day and pay it forward to others. Be gracious. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting verse 8, Paul says, I'm not command, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. He gave them a competition here. Let's run this race to the end together. Let's see who can give the most to help those who need, who have a need. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you through His poverty might become rich. Not have eternal life, but rich in the grace that He's given you today to live like children of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Ushering in the kingdom of heaven here and now by, like I said, stamping out injustice, poverty, abuse, everything else. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, because we can be easily distracted by the devil. And do this according to your means. <clears throat> For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not what you don't have. Verse 13, Our desire is not that others might be, rele be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but there might be equality. Boy, that's something that's not in this world, not in the United States for sure. I want you to have what I have? Why wouldn't I? Why would I want you to have less than what I have? Can you give me any reason why? Why would I want to be the, the mansion up on the hilltop down here? Why wouldn't we all want to be somewhere right there in the middle? Why wouldn't we want to be? Why should anyone be suffering in this world if someone else has the means to help them up? Are you like Christ? Do you have His mindset? Our desire is not that others may be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there may be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. See how God works through you? So that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. And that's not Christian communism. That is love because I want to give, because I don't want to see you hurting or in need. Verse 16, thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern for you. Oh, it just happens to be that after you read Corinthians, if you read Corinthians, then you read Titus. So now that means a little bit more to you. 
So you should have read the rest of 2 Corinthians this week and started on two chapters of Titus. Titus is real long. You've got one chapter still to go, just so you know. Paul boasts about his sufferings in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 12, he tells God about a thorn in the flesh, or tells us about a thorn in the flesh that God gave him, it says, so that he would understand grace. Whatever this thorn in the flesh is, we don't know, but Paul continued to say, please take this from me. Please take this from me. But God said, what? My grace is sufficient. No matter what circumstance you're in, you should be thanking God, praising Him, and being gracious with what little you have. Remember the woman who gave the two mites? So that you can be gracious to God and to others. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Well, now that's a concept that's against the world, isn't it? But see, when you're weak, God can work through you, making you strong. It's His power and His might. It's His reason that you were created in the first place. It's His reason and will that you have been redeemed. And it is His will that you live like Jesus in this world until Jesus returns. Fixing your eyes on Him and running the race well. So you have to ask the question, is God's grace sufficient for you? Is it enough for you? And here's the thing, and I can give you plenty of scripture and we'll make this another sermon. When you restrict God's grace, look out. There's where the whole prosperity gospel comes from. The more you give to God, the more He'll give to you. But not so that you will be prosperous, so that you can be rich to others, you fool. That's why that man's barns were filled in the first place, because there were people who had need for food. But he said, no, I'll build bigger barns for myself. But the Lord said, you fool, your life will be required of you today. Because he wasn't rich to others. Don't think of yourself better than you are. Take heed. <clears throat> when you're weak, you can experience God's love and his grace like never before. His provision for taking care of you and His strength to pick you up and walk w with you through whatever it is. Paul is making one last exhortation to the church in Corinth, and he asked him to come alongside him and the other true teachers of the Gospels, to imitate him as he imitates Jesus Christ. He's calling them to be servants and ambassadors. But will the church in Corinth do this? Will you do this? And in chapter 13, Paul warns them, that's the last chapter, he, said, he warns them to examine themselves. We don't have any other letters that he wrote to the church. We don't know. But he left them, with, he even told them, you know, he might bring a rod with him when he came to visit again and everything. But he said, examine yourself. Because it doesn't matter what I preach or anything else if you don't examine yourself. If you don't let the Spirit of God live through you. You can say good sermon all day long or bad sermon or whatever else, or I agree with you or don't agree with you, but let yourself be examined by yourself and who you're supposed to look to is Jesus Christ. Oh, I can't be like Jesus in this world. He gave you a spirit so you would be like him in this world. If heaven is a perfect place and we're going to be filled with the spirit totally to live this life, the power of God is in you now to live this life. But you have to decide if His grace is sufficient for you. So there's a question, and what is the gospel? What is the gospel that you're believing? What is the gospel that you're living? What is the gospel that you're doing? Because there are tons of false gospels out there, and they are Satan's ploy to distract you, so you will follow and serve Him rather than serve the Lord. In Titus then, Titus starts out this way, Titus 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect. He wrote this to further their faith, the faith to live like these ancients of the Old Testament that were uh, considered righteous because they lived by faith, and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, to leading that life that you say you can't live. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which is now, and which now is a, the, His appointed season, He has brought to life 
through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Remember, false leaders are already in this church trying to distract and let Christians become astray or, or tossed around at sea. If you keep reading verse 16 of Titus 1, they claim to know God, but, their acts, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Unfit for any good deed to others. Because they live for themselves. They're not content. They are lovers of money. They have forgot to practice hospitality and brotherly love. They are not following King Jesus. The next verse, if you keep reading chapter 2, verse 1, if you continue to read it as a flow, you, however, that means you're different. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. So that means you need to preach this way. I claim to know God, and by my actions I testify of Him, of His love for me, of my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ who has changed me. I used to do those things, and you might be surprised by them. But now I do this by the power of the Spirit because God has saved me and redeemed me and is working through me. I do my best by the power of the Spirit to live a holy life, being obedient and fit for doing all good things. Not some good things, all good things. Because that's the opposite of what that other verse says, if you change those things around. If I were trying to prove a point, which I'm really not, all these scriptures come together, don't they? Are we living like Jesus Christ in this world? Titus 2, verses 11 through 14, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Wow, that should motivate you to be different. Even if the Holy Spirit wasn't living in you, giving you the power to do it, you are saved from eternal damnation. Act like it. Not saying you don't. Don't throw too many. But live like it. Live like God's grace is the greatest thing, that Jesus Christ is the greatest thing, that it is sufficient for you, that you are content with it, that you are a good steward, that you are a servant of the Most High, that you're ushering in the kingdom of heaven. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this world present age, not when I get to heaven. I'm doing this while we, together, wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we have that same mindset. He is the one who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do what is good. Not eager just to talk about it. Not eager just to read scripture or pray. But eager to do what is good. Thinking of others over myself. Fighting injustice. Loving one another. Showing hospitality. The author of Hebrews, whoever he is, and Paul, are trying their best to portray to, this, to these churches to be a people who are holy, and love others as much as they love themselves because this is what pleases God. This is His children. This is the way God always intended for His children to be and redeemed even more and given power by the Holy Spirit to live this life. So you need to run the race marked out for you and run it well all the way to the finish line. You want to race? Ephesians 2. Verse 8, you know it. For by grace, there you go. By grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. So don't get conceited and proud there if you're doing these things, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, or His workmanship, or His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus. Oh, there's that again. To do good works. I didn't put those words in there. I just picked the verses which God prepared in advance for us to do. So are we doing them? Now, that verse, verse 8 started out with 4. That's a prepositional phrase, so I should go back and see what it's tying together. So I'm going to go back to Ephesians 2, chapter 1. As for you, 
Remember Titus 2, 1, you ha however, you're to live godly, not just proclaim it, but to live that way. Ephesians 2, verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and, transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air. You, you follow one king or the other, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us used to live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And it's so easy to go in here and say, well, yeah, those desires of the flesh are this, this, this. If I'm not loving others the way that I should and fighting the injustice and, and those things, then am I really living an obedient life? Because Jesus tells me to do that. But because of His great love, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We're already present with God also through His Spirit. We have communion with Him. We are in, entered into the Holy of Holies. The curtain has been torn. The Old Testament saints are saying, Wow! Look what a Christian has. Ugh in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. How's he going to show them if you're not gracious? Expressing his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good work which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's a gift from God. Grace is. It's grace of your salvation. And I don't know about you, but if I give a gift to somebody and they never ever use it or they sell it, it kind of irritates me, doesn't it? I won't say anything any further. Use the grace that God has given you to be gracious. The gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is really good news. So share it. Live it. Because of grace, you're forgiven. Because of grace, you have been made alive. By grace, you can do things by being loving to God and loving to others, things that please God. Are you living that way? We've been given grace for what? So that we can give, do good works. And this was even before creation as we know it even took place. So is the gospel good news to you? Are you loving more and more? Are you being hospitable more and more? Are you remembering the mistreated, those that are suffering, those that are in prison? Are you being pure and loyal in your relationships? Are you a lover of money or not a lover of money? Are you content? Are you mindful of your leaders? Are you imitating them? And most of all, are you imitating Christ? Because He walks and runs with you. All the way through. All the way to the finish line when he claims his bride. The gospel of Jesus doesn't mere, merely remove our penalty of sin. It is a gospel that through God's children, heaven comes to earth. Do you think of it that way? You are the stewards. You are the ambassadors. The kingdom has been birthed. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you are Jesus' hands and feet. In Matthew 5, verse 15, 14 and 15, I'm reading from the NLT now instead of the NIV. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. The next verse, in the same way. Let your good deeds shine. Let them glory. Let them light up this world. Out for all to see, so that everyone will play, praise, glorify, shine on your heavenly Father. If grace means anything to you, be gracious. So let's go and live like Jesus. I'm going to close with a story, and then there's a little song that I'm going to play. You never know. There was a man at a convenience store who did not have enough money to pay for the few items that he had. 
The man behind him tapped the man on the shoulder and said, you don't need to turn around or do anything. Just please accept this payment for your, your goods. This man took the money without ever seeing the man that gave it to him and his family, without ever knowing a reason why. Nine years passed. A pastor was giving a sermon, and afterwards a man walked up to the preacher and shared this story about how he had come to faith in Christ. Several years ago, my wife and I and our children were destitute. We had lost everything. We had no jobs, no money, and were living in our car. We also lost all hope and agreed to make a su suicide pact, including our children. However, we decided to first share one last meal, so we drove out to a convenience store to buy some food and feed our children. But we didn't have enough money to pay. A man behind us asked if we'd take the money, and he would pay, the, pay this for us, and he said that Jesus loves you. We left the store and drove to the place where we were going to end our lives, and we wept there for hours, contemplating those words, Jesus loves you. We could not go through with it, so we drove away. As we drove, we noticed a church sign, signboard, and out front it said, Jesus loves you. We went to that church that very next Sunday, and both my wife and I were saved. The father of that family recognized the pastor's voice as the same that he heard that night that day. Now, fathers, especially this is Father's Day, be a father. Imitate your heavenly father. Know the things that he's given you to raise these children well. They are your blessing, your heritage. Don't chase after the world. Chase after them. Write the scriptures in their hearts. Teach them the faith that you have by showing it in action. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your wonderful, amazing grace. Through your grace, Lord, fill us, complete us, make us a people that serve you. Make us a people that have the mindset of Jesus Christ. Make us a people that think of others over ourselves. Make us a people that don't sit around and pray, but get up and do based off the power and the gifts that you have given us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. May we be his hands and feet until he returns. In Jesus' name we pray.